We have, uh, di we have this discussion arranged for today between Mr. Hamza and Professor Pervez Hudboy on the topic religion and rationality. We thank you all for coming on such a short notice. This debate was just finalized today that we're going to be having it. So inshallah we'll begin uh, officially with uh, Mr. Hamza as he would take 30 minutes. I'll just walk you over the um, format. Both speakers will speak for 30 minutes on this topic and then we will have 15 minutes for rebuttal. And then after that, we'll have a 30 minutes question and answer session. Okay, so to begin, I would like to invite our speaker. He's a Greek convert to Islam. Nine years ago, he converted. He has uh, debated prominent, <coughs> p prominent personalities like uh, Mr. Dan Barker. He has um, different uh, author. He's authored a, a paper on embryology as well in embryology of the Qur'an. This speciality includes religion, philosophy, <coughs> psychology, and different topics of the like. So without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Hamza Andres Zutzes. Okay, I'm going to start as Muslims do in the name of Allah, in the name of God. In alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Brothers and sisters and friends, and respected academics, and the warmest Islamic greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you very much for coming out, coming out here today to discuss a very important topic. I want to make this interactive. I don't want this to be a debate because I think Pakistan has too many of these types of debates. I want it to be a conversation, a little intellectual journey. So I believe in order to answer the question, or the theme, the topic, which has been rubbed off, <laughs> religion, or rational, religion and rationality, it would be best if I provide a cogent, positive case for the worldview that I adopt, which is Islam. And in order to do that in the context of rationality, I have to justify, provide a substructure to my argument of <coughs> Islam, which is, namely, that I believe a deity exists, God exists, and the Qur'an, which is the book of the Muslims, it is a miraculous discourse. It's a discourse that when we exhaust nature, we exhaust reality, we can't find a naturalistic explanation. And once we can't find a naturalistic explanation, I would humbly assert that it's a signpost to the divine. Following these two discussions, I'm going to want to talk about scientism as a epistemology, as an epistemological method of thinking, and discuss its implications with regards to existential questions. For example, what does it mean to be me? Where do I place myself in this society? Who am I? Why am I? Whose am I? And also I want to talk about the limited scope of scientism, which would be an interesting discussion, and also the need for religion to provide moral filters for scientific discourse, which is very important. I'll give you some examples for that. So to begin, brothers and sisters and friends, and respected academics, Let's first talk about the first major assertion of the rational foundations of the Islamic worldview, which is namely that God exists. That Allah, the divine, is a reality. It's not a spaghetti, spaghetti monster. It's not some kind of made-up theory. It's not like the fairy, fairy tales we listen to when we're young. It's not a myth or a legend. Rather, God is the reality. And the way I want to do this is not by advocating a philosophy of God of the gaps which it basically is, we can't explain reality, so we squeeze God in there. I don't want to do that. What I want to do is let's talk about reality. So when I talk about reality, I want to talk about the universe, the cosmos, this entire huge thing that's apparently expanding, and its rate of expansion is increasing, this cosmos, this entire universe. And it is now well known, according to mathematical, philosophical, and cosmological evidence, that the universe itself began at a point in time. The universe itself began. It was brought into being. The steady state theory with regards to cosmology is 1960s, slightly old. We don't believe in an eternal universe anymore. Rather, what we do, we believe, or we know, or we can assert humbly that the universe began at a certain point. And we could justify this in various ways. The first justification, I would argue, is a philosophical one. 
And this is concerning the topic of infinity, okay? Infinity. Infinity. Now, to assert that the universe never had a beginning, which means it didn't begin at a certain point, to assert that would imply that we have an infinite history of past events. An infinite history of past events. But I would argue upon reflection, this is quite absurd. Because the infinite as a concept cannot be exported into the real world. As the philosophers say, the infinity has no ontological export into the real world. It may exist in mathematics with certain axioms and conventions, but in the real world, it just leads to paradoxes. Let me give an example. What is infinity minus 5? Okay, practically, if I had inf an infinite number of people in this room, and I took 5 people away, how many people do I have left? Infinity. infinity. Now, according to the mathematical realm of discourse, that is coherent. But in the real world, it doesn't really make sense because it should be 5 less than infinity, which means I should be able to count how many people there are in this room. Let me give you another example. Say we had 50 bananas in this room, or 50 chopli kebabs. <laughs> the reason I'm saying chapli kebabs is I just recently had food poisoning in Pakistan because of chapli kebabs. Maybe because it was made of chaplis. <laughs> yeah, slippers. <laughs> so say you had 50 chapli kebabs in this room. If at every possible moment I add another chapli kebab, would I ever reach an amount that we can describe as infinite? No. The reason being because you could always add another one. So it indicates in the real world the infinity is potential, never actual. So if we apply this to the universe, we know that the past, which events are real things, cannot be infinite. So we can't have an infinite history of past events. It necessitates a beginning. This is a mathematical, philosophical evidence, okay? Supporting this, and I don't rely on this too much, but it is a supporting argument, is current cosmology. We've all heard of the Big Bang. Put your hand up. Who says the Big Bang? Good. It's not that thing that happens after too many curries. Okay? <laughs> Rather, the Big Bang, or if we follow a particular model of the Big Bang, like the hot standard model, it says that the universe came into being. It started at a point in time. T is equal to zero. If you want to see it graphically, it basically looks sometimes like this, yeah? Where this is time, okay? So T here is equal to zero. But the point here I want to elaborate on is that there are other models. Okay, we have like the quantum fluctuation models, we have the oscillating models. Nevertheless, each one of these models, especially according to the renowned theoretical physicist Alexander Vilenkin, he asserts that all these type of models still necessitate a beginning in time. So we can roughly say this is a supporting argument to our first argument that the universe began to exist. This is a almost a conclusion we can healthily, in a healthy way, conclude. So the universe began to exist. Now, if the universe began to exist, then there's some implications here. We have to think about something. Because, let me give you an easy example. If you hear this, it's a noise, right? You? Why? Where did it come from, okay? We have to question it because it came into being. It wasn't always noisy, we heard a noise. Similarly, what's the same with the small bang is the same with the big bang, right? Or with the universe. So I would assert we need to question this, and we could question it in the following way. One, either the universe came from nothing, okay? That's our option. Nothing. Zilch. Kuchne. Nothing, yeah? As you Pakistanis say, Muchne to Kuchne. Yeah? <laughs> Now, this is philosophically absurd, because out of nothing, what comes, brothers, sisters, and friends? Nothing. Nothing. If I went into my pocket, and I gave you this, what would you have? Nothing. Because it's? Nothing. Exactly. It's nothing. This is why P.J. Swart, in his publication about time, he asserts that what we find inconceivable is that something could arise from nothing. A contention to this argument is the quantum Vacuum, okay? Quantum vacuum. Now, some people assert, or some scientists assert, that 
things can come from nothing because we have subatomic events in the quantum vacuum <coughs> that arise without any causes. So therefore, something can come from nothing. Now, there's an issue here. First and foremost, the quantum vacuum is not nothing. It is actually something. According to the philosopher of science, John Buckinghorn, he asserts that the quantum vacuum is a rich structure and it's a sea of fluctuating energy. So one, it's not nothing. Secondly, these events, okay, that somehow come into existence, okay, these type of probabilities, if you like, they do not have to be described in an indeterministic way. Because there's almost like two kind of schools if you want to be crude with quantum physics. You have indeterminism, which asserts there are no causes, they just happen randomly, and there's determinism. So you have like the Copenhagen interpretation, or you have the David Bohm interpretation. And you don't have to hold on to one interpretation. Especially since philosophically, and we could discuss this in the Q&A, philosophically, I would argue it's stronger to hold on to a deterministic view on quantum theory. But that's another discussion. But it's not, underlying, it's not an undercutting defeat to our argument here. So we could still argue things do not come from nothing. <coughs> the second option is self-creation. Okay, Self-creation. So the universe could self-create. Why is this absurd? Who could argue this? One of the best universities in Pakistan. <laughs> well, self-creation philosophically is absurd because that would imply that something exists and doesn't exist at the same time. Let me give you a crude example. Can your mother give birth to herself? That would be very messy, right? Yes. Yeah. She can't. It's just an impossibility. So self-creation is an impossibility. A contention to this argument is this physicist called Stephen Hawking. Who's heard of Stephen Hawking? Who's read his book, The Grand Design? I've tried to. You've tried to, yeah? <laughs> you know why? I don't blame you. You know why? Because he starts by saying philosophy is dead, and his whole book is full of what? <laughs> philosophy. <laughs> this doesn't make any sense to me, yeah? It's like saying, starting a book, an English literature book, by saying language is dead. It's saying the whole book writing in a language, yeah? <laughs> So Stephen Hawking, he wrote a book called The Grand Design, and I believe around page 60, he talks about self-creation is possible. It is possible because you can't have something from nothing, but remember when we talked about the quantum vacuum? His nothing actually means quantum vacuum, and he discusses that too. Also, what he says, you can have self-creation if you have something called gravity. Okay? But there's a problem here. What is gravity? Well, it's basically the law of attraction between two bodies, right? So he's saying gravity must exist before matter exists. But you need matter for gravity in the first place. Right? So it doesn't make sense to me. It's just like almost implausible. Although, don't get me wrong, mathematically this makes sense. But practically it doesn't, or philosophically it doesn't. Why do we have to hold on to the actions and assumptions of mathematics? It's a tool. Not the gospel truth. Do you see? There's a big difference here. And this is why we're going to get more into the discussion of the relationship between rationalism and empiricism. Because Professor Hoodboy, I just read his book in the car, it's a very fascinating read. The use of the word rationalism from a philosophical perspective in Western philosophy, his use is going towards empiricism, not rationalism itself. Because the premise of rationalism is a priori, an innate concept thesis. That you believe in things external to experience because they're necessary, like mathematical and logical truths. But we'll discuss this later. So self-creation is absurd. So for me, the best explanation is what? Is that there must have been something that brought the universe into being. It brought the universe into being. And that for me is the best explanation because we've actually discussed the other two explanations. If there's another explanation, let me know and we could discuss this. So creation of the universe is the best explanation. Now, if something created the entire universe, it has to be intelligent. Why? Because there are, there are things called inductive generalizations of patterns we perceive in the universe. There are laws. There are laws in the universe. And if there's laws, something created the whole universe implies a lawgiver. And if it's a lawgiver, it implies it's intelligence. Also, it must be more powerful since it created the whole universe. And therefore, we are coming to the conclusion upon conceptual analysis that this thing that brought the universe into being is the divine. This is why the Quran 
eloquently talks about the divine in a very simple way in the 112th chapter. And it says, Qul huwa Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan. Say, he's got the one, the unique, the eternal. He begets not those he begotten, and there is nothing like him, like unto him. This is why when we say something created the universe, it must be outside of the universe. Because it created space and time. Hence, it's immaterial. Nothing is like unto him. So, our reason, based upon reality, conforms the 112th chapter to the, of the Quran. It conforms to the 112th chapter of the Quran. This is fascinating for me. And this is not God of the gaps. This is reasoning. We've looked at reality, spoken about reality, how, why, when, what. Oh. Therefore, there must be a creator. And these are some of his attributes. And this is in line with the Quranic narrative. So we have good reasons to believe in the divine. And this is based upon reason. I didn't use any faith here. Did I say to you, believe because you have to believe? Did I hit your head and say, hallelujah? No? I didn't say none of this stuff, right? Did I say what Richard Dawkins says in his book, The God Delusion, on page 157158, when he says, there's apparent design in the universe, but we can't explain it. We don't have an evolution theory for physics yet, but we just have to wait for one. Am I telling you to wait for a new theory? Am I telling you to have faith? I'm not saying this. It's just reason. Use your mind. As the Quran says, do you not use your mind? So that's the first foundation of Islam. The second one is the miraculous nature of the Quranic discourse. Now the Quranic discourse is an amazing book from my perspective. And I'm not going to use science because I agree with Professor Hoodboy. People like Zakir I haven't said anything yet. Oh, in your book. Unless what you write is you lie, but I don't think you're a liar, so I'm assuming, <laughs> I'm assuming what you wrote in your book is good. It's actually the truth. And I agree with Professor Hoodboy and I empathize with him, especially in being an academic and a physicist. With all these Muslim apologists saying, look, the science in the Quran is detailed. We spoke about the Big Bang before the Big Bang was revealed, and it's absolute, but science necess ne necessitates that you can't speak in absolutes anyway. So there's a contradiction from the first place. And I take another view, which I think is the classical tradition of Islam, that says, look, when the Quran does talk about natural phenomena, when it does so, it does so in a teleological way, which means for you to see that there is a signpost, there's a signpost to the divine, there's a signpost to the transcendent. And when it does so in ambiguous or specific terms, it doesn't predate science, but it doesn't negate it. So the terms it uses will never go against reality. That's the nuance point. That's the nuance point which we haven't had a discussion about. Namely because we don't know Arabic and we don't go into the classical tradition to read about what scholars have said about this. This is why Sheikh Muhar Ali in his book, The Quran and the Orientalist, he makes this point. He says the Quran is not contingent on a 7th century worldview. Rather, its lexical items, the linguistic items of the Quran, because of the depth of meaning, correlate with modern science. It doesn't mean it predates science. No, this is a obnoxious view in my view. You have to have a balanced middle road and say, look, because we have a rational belief which I'm going to dis discuss about, that the Quran is from the divine, when it talks about natural phenomena, it correlates with modern science. We could discuss this more in the Q&A. So I agree with Professor Huber from that perspective. Now the Quran is a very intrusive book. Actually, not only is it intrusive, it's a very imposing book. Because it seeks to do what? To intrude in the inner dimensions of man. It seeks to intrude in his aql, in his intellect, and his nafsir, his disposition, his psychology. But this imposition is very positive. How? Why? You. Because it asks you profound questions. Do you not use your brain? Do they not reflect within themselves? And in themselves do they not see? And thus, do we explain our signs and evidence in detail for those who reflect? And the Arabic word comes from the triliteral stem which if you go to the classical dictionaries, it means don't reflect like a desert romantic, you know? Milk in one hand, maybe cigar in the other, and you're lying back and enjoying the sun. Not that kind of reflection. The reflection that we're talking about is that the thing that you're reflecting upon, you must inquire about its implications. What does it mean that there's a beginning to the universe? What does it mean that we have a consciousness? What does it mean? 
that according to M theory, or current studies in M theory in Durham University that I'm in touch with postdoctorate researchers, they are coming to the conclusion that the fundamental reality of reality, the fundamental feature of reality, is not time and space anymore. Well, there's logical necessary truths like math mathematics. So where's the grand mathematician? But that's the whole point, people. We need to reflect deeply. Don't be shallow thinkers. Just accept something just because X, Y, and Z said it. Reflect, think. So the Quran makes us think in that way. Furthermore, the Quran goes further than this, and it challenges mankind with regards to its authorship. In the second chapter, in the 23rd, 23rd verse, the Quran says, وَإِن كُنْتُمْ فِرِيبٍ مِمَّا نَزَلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ بِمِثْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُحَدَاءَكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And if you are in doubt, agnostics, atheists, academics, thinkers, secularists, <coughs> whoever they are, if you doubt in this book, that we send down to us a refrain to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon whom be peace, then bring one chapter like it. One small chapter. Call on your witnesses and your supporters, Besides God in Kuntum Sadaqeen, if you are indeed truthful in your claim. And this, according to the Mufassirun, those who explain the Quran, has to do not with science, but something very rational to do with language. And this is amazing. I was reading in Professor Hudboy's book, something very fascinating about Noam Chomsky. I studied psychology and we studied psycholinguistics and we also studied Noam Chomsky about the innate concept thesis of language that there's almost like a universal grammar is embedded within, within us. I disagree with the professor's conclusions with regards to that it came from an evolution perspective because I don't think it has any pre evolution <coughs> forerunners but that's a rational discussion that could take place because language and reason are very interlinked and if we read Nietzsche, he makes an amazing point that you shouldn't trust your own, mind, own minds if we did come from a biological process. Because if it was about natural selection, about survival of the fittest, then necessarily the, most, the, mo the, the person who has the best reasoning abilities may not survive. And he combined with C.S. Lewis, they have a very interesting argument on this, which we could discuss more in the Q&A. But nevertheless, this is about language. And in the Arabic language, you have certain forms, literary forms. And this is not aesthetic reception. It's not how nice it sounds like Shakespeare. Who knows about Shakespeare? Or Sheikh Zubur? <laughs> Muslims always have a claim on everything, right? <laughs> but I'm only kidding. Like Shakespeare, when he says, Oh Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, oh, Romeo? Deny thy father and deny thy name. But let's make it a bit more Pakistani. Oh Abdullah, oh Abdullah, deny thy mother, deny thy tribe. Yeah? Whatever. It's nothing to do with aesthetic reception. It's to do with the structural features of the language. And what we have in Arabic language, we have prose, which is Split into rhyme prose and just normal prose, okay? And rhyme prose is called saja, S A J with a Hamza. And we have Mursal, which is normal speech. And the other category is poetry, which has 16 rhythmical patterns called the Al Bihar. This comes from the word Bahar which means sea, so it's like the waves on the sea, the 16 rhythmical patterns. Now the point is, right prose is defined in an objective sense. If you read the works of David J. Stewart, the Arabist and Orientalist, he discussed that rhyme prose is defined by having an end rhyme, and its rhythm is accent-based, not syllabic-based accent. For example, like English nursery rhymes. Ba, ba, black sheep, have you any? There you go, you've been anglified and colonized. <laughs> Where are your own? Nursery rhymes, yeah? So, so, and that's the definition, it has its own internal accent based rhythm. And also, it has a concentrated, concentrated use of rhetorical devices. Normal speech is normal speech. Poetry is defined by ending on a rhyme, and it has, it has a rhythm, a rhythmical structure that's metrical, which is based upon the syllables, short syllables and, sh and long syllables. For example, at Tawil, is one of the rhythmical patterns, and it goes something like this. Ba, 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 like a waltz, yeah? And there's 16 of these. Now the Quran doesn't fit any of these categories. It has de the Arabic language, even though we have 28 limited words, finite grammatical rules, finite words, and when we exhaust them together, we still can't develop the form of the Quran. 
This is why David J. Stewart, who's the only person in the English language to talk about this, he says it's just Quran. Adrian Arbery, the famous translator of the Quran in his introduction, he talks about that the Quran is a unique fusion of both metrical and non metrical speech. Professor Bruce Lawrence from Duke University, in his book, The Quran, a biography on page number eight, he says, as tangible science, Quranic verses are expressive of an inexhaustible truth. They signify meaning, laid within meaning, light upon light, miracle after miracle. You have Dr. Martin Zamet from the Netherlands, another Arabic scholar. He says the Quran is the most eminent written manifestation of the Arabic language. We go on and on and on. But the point being here is that the Quran cannot fit into any of these literary forms. And we know this for many technical reasons which we could discuss in the Q&A. But my point here is the philosophical implications. The philosophical implications is this. What do we mean by miracle? Now we don't mean the old David Hume ironclad description of a miracle, something that transcends natural law. Because that doesn't make sense. What are natural laws? Natural laws are just inductive generalizations of patterns we perceive in the universe. They're just patterns. And they're just inductive generalizations. If something changes from the pattern, it doesn't mean it's miraculous. What I'm talking about in miracle is the Islamic philosophical position, which is you can't find a naturalistic explanation. <clears throat> Almost like an act of impossibility. And we see this with the Quran. We have 28 letters, finite grammatical rules, finite words. We exhaust them. We can't create the literary form of the Quran. This is amazing. This is like a signpost to the divine, signpost to the supernatural. So we can conclude that the Qur'an, we have good reasons to believe in the Qur'an based on rationality, okay? Now, let me end with the last five minutes on scientism. Scientism, brothers and sisters and friends, is not the only method to form conclusions about life. This epistemological thesis of reality is not the only thesis. You see, the unique thing about the Qur'an is such a reasonable book it gives you different methods of thinking that you can combine. The intuitive method, the emotional method, the political method, the rational, the logical, the scientific, the empirical. It gives you a whole scope of this mental play for you to use to form conclusions about man, life, and the universe. Just to stick to scientism, okay, is self-defeating. Because what does scientism say? That scientism is the only method to form conclusions about reality. But that's the problem, because you can't use science to prove that in the first place. Because the statement, because it's, it's about metaphysics. This is a metaphysical assumption. You have to assume this to be true, because you can't prove this to be true. I want someone to prove to me that science is the only method to form conclusions about life. You can't prove it using science. It's self-defeating. Similarly, you need mathematical and logical truths, like Egg plus egg is equal to two, yeah? One plus one is equal to two. You can find that in reality, but that's logically necessary as well. And you need this before you have science. And you can't argue, well, science can prove this. Well, it would be arguing in a circle. Also, scientism can't prove moral truths. Moral truths. The only person trying to attempt this is Sam Harris. He did a huge failure. He called it, in his book, The Moral Landscape, he said there are peaks and troughs of well-being, and the peaks are our moral truths. But the point is to defeat this, is you could find a pedophile in one of those peaks. Because he has well-being when he's acting pedophilically, right? <laughs> There's such a word. So it undercuts the whole kind of thesis that you can get morality from science. You can't. Imagine going to your wife, Mary John, Sonu, I love you. And she goes, Bas <laughs> Chukar. It's nothing but chemicals in your brain. <laughs> hey, what, would she, what would you do? Just give her a pie, yeah? Not that we advocate that, of course, yes. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to say is they can't even claim moral truths or things like love, yeah? Also, what we have to understand that scientism itself, oh, we already discussed that, can't confirm logical truths, which is, which is, which is true. The other thing we need to discuss is scientism needs moral filters. Because in 2001, and in this century, what did we have? We had people advocating a new form of eugenics, saying, and this was in a Harvard peer-reviewed journal, said that abortions are fantastic in America, because they lower the crime rate. Because poor people have abortions, and poor people are most likely to have crime. Do we need moral filters for science or not? Because science can't provide it, because it's abstract and cold. It's reductionist. It, 
it reduces man to molecule. What are you? You're matter plus matter plus matter plus a bit of chance. That's it, and you're nothing really. The philosophical implications of sci scientism as a worldview is extremely dangerous. Because a bomb in Iraq is not in a sense being killed, just a rearrangement of molecules. Now, if, you, if you now claim, if you adopt this as a fundamentalist scientist without having a philosophical mind, and you say, this is my worldview, then you can't claim any moral truths. How could you? Because you can't even have objective morality without a divine. The divine is the only conceptual anchor that transcends human subjectivity. Otherwise, it's relative or subjective. And this is why we need religion. It's so reasonable. Finally, scientism denies our existential realities, who we are as human beings. Purpose, not ultimate purpose from a scientist, scientific perspective. Don't get me wrong, I love science. Psychology is a pseudoscience here. Yeah? But I'm saying we need other methods as well. Scientism is not rationality. It's a sub-category of rationality, which we should discuss in the Q&A. Now, it doesn't provide ultimate purpose in life. You don't have one, because what does it say? You either have no purpose, or, according to Richard Dawkins, in The Selfish Gene, we're here just to propagate our what? Yeah. Yeah. DNA. But DNA robots, people. So how dare anyone complain about the Muslim, the Muslim law of polygamy? We're just propagating our DNA. <laughs> <laughs> Contentious issue, I know. But the point I'm trying to make is, is that it raises a huge issues here that we shouldn't be reductionists, have a rational approach to man life in the universe. I hope to engage with you further in the Q and the rebuttals. God bless you. Salam alaikum. <laughs>
To give you another example, in the old days, people used to think that the reason you had earthquakes or tsunamis or mass starvations or epidemics was because somebody was displeased. And I should say, just the old days, even today, a lot of people think that, yes, earthquakes happen because we have seen. In 2005, when that October 8th earthquake came, and there were something like 90,000 people dead in the northern areas of Pakistan, you had the bulk of this country thinking, saying, that ye tahre illahi we must have done something wrong so that God is so angry with us. If you went to the areas where the earthquake had struck, 100% of people believed this. Well, it wasn't that people were willing to exercise rationality. Hey, hang on a minute. If it was really God who was angry, why on earth were the poor people hit the worst? Why was, and this I saw for myself, a chai khana which was in perfect shape but the masjid opposite to it had collapsed like this? Why had this happened at 8 o'clock in the morning on a day of Ramzan? And on the day when people were fasting. Why did it happen to people who often pray the most? And yet, because they believed in Surah Zalzal, lots of people believe that. Now, just a few days after that, I had a debate on television with uh, the ulema on this matter. And these debates don't happen very much, Mr. Hamza. They happen very seldom, because people are very afraid of talking about these things. And the ulema were saying, yeah, this is azab illahi And one of them who was, who was more enlightened, he said, no, it is not actually azab, because the azab can only happen while the prophet was still alive. It is a tambi, which is a warning to, to get your act straight. Otherwise, God will hit you even harder. On the other hand, scientific rationality says that you look for the reasons, and those reasons are subterranean, and you look for it in the formation of the <laughs> Earth. The Earth, when it was formed, was a hot ball of matter. It was molten, and then slowly its surface gel, it, it cooled down. There were plates that were formed. These, tec these plates then started colliding each other. When two tectonic plates hit each other, and one subducts, and the other, and this causes the rising of mountains. Well, that's what causes earthquakes. So as I tried to explain this to the ulema, they wouldn't understand. They said, it is written in the Quran. How dare you say that this is physical causes? So I said, ulema karam aap se mera ek sawal hai. There's only one question. Ye bataye ke chand par zalzale kyun aate? Wahan to koi gunegar to hai ni? And they uh, sort of scratched their head. And they said, uh, well, um, let's get on to the next thing. They didn't have an answer for that. Now, in searching for causes, we, we ultimately deduce laws. Those laws are supposed to be universal. And now, a feature of rationality is that all those who use those rules, independent of who they are, whether they're fat or thin, whether they're born in Australia or Borneo or Pakistan or America, when they use those rules, they come to the same kind of conclusion. Now, this doesn't mean that there are no differences. This doesn't mean that everybody who uses the same set of rules come to the same conclusion. That is not true. And yet there is a basis for argumentation. So science, which has 
which is based upon rationality, upon reason, upon logic, insists that it is the exercise of observation combined with experiment, combined with reason, that ought to be the arbiter of what is true and what is false. And therefore, you will have scientists who are black, who are white, who are brown, who come from this part of the earth or that part of the earth, who've gone to bad schools or good schools, who are Hindu or Muslim or Jewish or Christian or whatever, but they always come to the same conclusion. On the other hand, if religion was a rational enterprise, well, if, or rather I should say, if religion was a rational enterprise, then you would expect that at least there'd be a broad consensus on some of the major things that religion builds upon. Now, my friend Hamza talked about the beginning, about uh, the cosmos, kun faya kun. Yes? Well, he used that as an argument that the, that the steady state creation theory was wrong. Well, I'm sorry. The steady state creation could have been right. It turns out it wasn't. But it was decided upon on the basis of scientific evidence, because it could not explain how the elements are distributed in the universe. It could not explain the three degrees K background. And that's the reason it was rejected. It wasn't rejected on some theological grounds. If you went on theological grounds, you'd be coming to the most absurd kind of conclusions about the beginning of the universe, or about any matter of physics, any matter which deals with the, with the physical universe. But coming back to religion as a rational enterprise, is it or is it not? Well, if it was, its practitioners would at least have some degree of common understanding with each other. But as I look around the world, I see there is none. You believe in one God, well, the Christians sort of believe in three gods. This is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Jews have one. The Hindus have, uh, I think it was 5,700 at the last count, but I think they've increased now. <laughs> you know, they find new idols to worship, and new things, they discover new things in the Mahabharata. Now, there are different ideas of how the universe came about. There are different ideas of the different explanations for natural phenomena. It's some god, well, you know, in, the, in Greek mythology, it was uh, Hades who lived under the ground and who would shake it, and that would cause the earthquakes. It would be Zeus who would throw down lightning bolts from the sky. I mean, every culture, every religion has had its own gods. And you want them to have yours, one, two, five, many, whatever, for heaven's sakes. Everybody has a right to do that. And you don't really have a right to say that my, my religion is better than their religion or their religion. Because it all depends upon where you were born. <coughs> which society were you born in? Which religion were you born in? And just like you didn't choose your parents, at least I didn't choose mine. I love them. I love them. But I didn't choose them. I didn't choose the country I was born into. I didn't choose my religion. And yeah, you could say, but. There's only one right religion, and so why don't why don't why doesn't everyone recognize that as such? Well, the problem is that every person who is born into a religion and is 
is uh, brought up in it believes that his or her religion is the right religion. But of course, we have a counter example. Here is a wonderful man, Hamza, who has changed his religion. What were you earlier, Greek Orthodox? I was a secular humanist. Secular humanist. And before that, I mean, what were you born into? Probably. Human, my dad's not religious. Oh, okay, all right. Okay, so he's like he's, he's like he's he's he's, he's like uh, so he's an atheist who's uh, converted into Islam. <laughs> but there are okay, then you could you could have Hindus converting into Islam. I think my uh, great great grandparents must have done that. I don't know. Never knew them. But only a small fraction of those born into a religion ever change. <laughs> and there's absolutely one, there's, there's a huge amount of evidence. In fact, it's been calculated that it's just less than 0.1% of those born into a religion move out of that religion into another religion. So how can anyone be convinced of the truth of his or her religion when it is a matter of accident, of pure chance? Look, I don't want to go on for too long, but I do want to point out the dangers which come when religion and science are joined together. You heard such an attempt today. And it's all very amusing, and I love the way Hamza speaks. But it's very dangerous, very dangerous. Because you can be led into all sorts of absurdities. You know these people who've been calculating the speed of light using the Quran? The internet is flooded with that. They've got 2.9983756 times 10 to the power 10 kilometers per second. And somebody else has done a calculus, some Egyptian Muslim who's done this calculus has got a slightly different figure, and then somebody else has done a calculation. Now the Quran does not give the speed of light in it. It's not a book of science. There is no scientific experiment that you can do to validate or to reject any theological book or doctrine. But look at these people. I will not use a harsh word for them. But they are pseudoscientists. They, I mean, they might have got a degree in physics or some science at some point. They're not practicing scientists. And even if they were, what they're talking about is cut off from the very roots of science. And they're doing no good to, to the religion whose truth they're trying to establish. Now, to give you this, to continue this example of the speed of light, you know that at CERN uh, in September, they discovered neutrinos which are <coughs> traveling faster than the speed of light. But you look, you, you go back to these, uh, to what these people have written on their websites, they say that nothing can travel faster than light, and angels travel at that speed. And they talk about Nar and Noor. Now, if angels can travel only at the speed of light, well, then neutrinos are going to outrace them. So you have, you'll have angels chasing neutrinos, neutrinos outside of God's control. What absurdity. I mean, what nonsense this is. I can give example after example of, of people who have, who have used the language of science, but who are cut off from the spirit of science. Because science is built upon testing. It's built upon <coughs> checking hypotheses. It's built upon observation. You don't accept anything or reject anything because you've been taught to, because that's the way it is. You do it. You empirically verify. So um, I see that I don't have any time left. That's OK. 
Um, I will expect questions from you. I come back to my point that you do no service to either science or to religion by trying to combine the two. If this had been, uh, if combining them had been fruitful, surely we would have seen some impact on, on, on science in Muslims. The fact is that for the last 1,000 years, now let's be honest to ourselves, have we Muslims produced any science of any worth at all in the last 1,000 years? Have we produced the concept of electricity, of antibiotics, of computers, of uh, genetics? Is there any scientific achievement that you can point to in the last 1,000 years? Answer is no, not one. So what's all this talk about all the science being in the Quran? The Quran is there to tell you how to behave, how you, what your moral values should be. It tells you how, how, how inheritance is to be done, how, you should, how, how many times a day you should pray. Well, that you should fast, etc. It's about rituals. It's about it's about values. It's not about science. And so those people who are all the time trying to dig out science from the Quran, let me ask, what have they achieved today? Zero achievement. I mean, there are 1.5 billion Muslims on Earth. Two Nobel Prize winners in science, one of whom was subsequently declared a heretic. The other one, and by the way, both of them, did all their good work, all their scientific work outside, in the West. Look at Muslim countries, zilch, zilch. So it's time for reflection, isn't it? Time to get out of this pseudo stuff talking about infinities and M theory and using that as proof of the correctness of Islam. Islam is correct because we were born into it. Of course, that's it. Why do you need proof? Thank you. With that, we finished with the first session, which was uh, the, the speeches by the respected speakers. Now I would like to request Brother Hamza for his 15 minutes of rebuttal. Well, shouldn't we have questions and answers? Uh, that's after the rebuttals. There's 15 minute rebuttals. Uh, he gives a rebuttal, then you give a 15 minute, and then there's a question after. OK, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much, Professor. First and foremost, I'm slightly disappointed because I think the professor didn't really actively listen to what I was talking about. No, why did I use science to justify the Quran in any shape or form? I actually agreed with his thesis that we shouldn't go into the Quran to look for scientific exper experimentation. Uh, that's my view. I, I even quoted the classical position in the Islamic philosophy, which is that whatever it says about reality, even if it's abstract, even if it's ambiguous, it just doesn't go against reality. And that's our view. We don't adopt this kind of modern, I call it the, the modernist view of like, all science is in the Quran, you can find M theory, X theory, Y theory, everything, yeah? We don't take that position. We just say because we can show via falsification test, which I discussed, if you don't believe it's from the divine, then bring a chapter like it with regards to its unique literary form. That's a falsification test, okay? That's a reasonable argument. Now, the point I'm trying to say here is, as a result of that, we conclude it's from the divine, it's a signpost to the supernatural, and therefore we accept the axiom that whatever the Quran says about reality doesn't go against reality. And that's a very important point. This is why the Quran doesn't adopt an Aristotelian or Galenic thesis on human embryology, because it doesn't say that semen is mixed with blood, or semen came from blood, or semen is mixed with menstrual blood. That was an Aristotelian position and a Galenic position. So the Quran doesn't reflect a 7th century worldview. I'm not saying it gives you details or you could become an embryologist as a result. No, of course not. But
But the position is, this doesn't go against reality. I think the professor should have been a little bit more attentive to what I was saying. So it would be more fruitful to the discussion. Also you say, why I bring science into the equation? Well, again, not attentive to the discussion. I think you're, you're loaded with presuppositions and historical baggage and you're superimposing on me. Let's have a frank discussion. And the frank discussion is this, is that I said that the Quran allows you to use various methodologies to come to conclusions about things. Empiricism, logic, reason. And when you bring them together, you come to certain conclusions, such as the divine is the divine and the Quran is miraculous. There was no contention to this in any shape or form. I could quote the steady state theory, why not? I'm a human being too, I use my brain. The Quran tells me to use my brain. Do you not use your intellect? So we use these methodologies to come to conclusions about things. And I did assert, I did assert very clearly that I'm not using science as the argument, rather it's a supporting argument. Isn't that right? He's nodding your head. Good. What's your name? Maryam. Maryam. See, even Maryam knows. <laughs> and she's not even the professor. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to say is, let's be attentive. So these are like straw mans. It's a logical fallacy. You're building a fake argument about someone. You're, you're misrepresenting someone's argument. Also, you talked about rationality and you defined it in your way. Fine. Even if you take your position, then I should be right then. Because I used a bit of observation, a bit of logic, and a bit of reason, and I came to a conclusion. If you disagree with it, tell me. So even with your approach to rationality, then you should be a Muslim. Or you should believe in Allah <laughs> from that perspective. But I disagree with your understanding of rationality. Rationality, especially from a Western philosophy, philosophical perspective, is that it believes in the a priori thesis. There are some innate knowledge. Like causality, for example. We know causality to be true not because of experiment experimentation. It's, it transcends experience. For example, if you take the Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, he discussed this and he said, we know causality to be necessarily true because of the innate concept. And he justified it in the following way. I can choose to look at the first row, the third row, the fifth row. But if someone run across this room, I have no choice but to see his front before I see his back. And the way I know, and the reason I know, and the way I know that I can choose and order my own perceptions is because of the innate concept of causality. So if one day an observation said to me there's no causality anymore, I'm not going to accept observation, because observation is subservient to reason, rationality, innate concept necessary thesis. You see? And it's a bigger discussion to have, but I don't think, I don't think the professor is well equipped in, 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 in Western philosophy. He's, he's an empiricist. Also, you talked about why isn't there a broad consensus? Why isn't everyone Muslim? You know, we should do things because everyone agrees with them. But I think that's so shallow. That's another logical fallacy. It's an argument of consensus. For example, if you were born in 1940s Germany, you would be killing Jews now because there was broad consensus to kill Jews. <coughs> I mean, that's not an argument just because there's a broad consensus. Come on, let's 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 follow the Quranic paradigm of that's not what I said. Well, I quoted you here, you could address it later, it's up to you. Also, you say about where, you know, the earthquakes were here for sin. I don't take that as a logical view. We don't know, we don't have revelation now that's telling us what this specific instance was. For example, it may be because of sin, it may be because of a test, whatever the case may be. But the Prophet Muhammad upon him, peace said, whoever dies under rubble is a martyr goes to paradise anyway. So we have a more of a metaphysical positive view about, about these realities. The atheist world reads, you die, then you become worm, which is me. But this death has a purpose, and we believe everything is purposeful. Now, you conflated two things here. You conflated the how with the why. Even if Muhammad said it's because of sin, he's not denying how it happens, though. It can't happen because of tectonic plate theory. You're conflating two things, another logical fallacy. The how and the why are two different things. If I say, my wife became pregnant because I love her, right? But how does she become pregnant? It's not because I love her, right? It's because we know the sperm mixes with the egg, and there's fertilization, and there's implantation in the uterine cavity into uterine mucosa. Yeah, uterine wall, rather. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and, and then after you have the various stages of embryology, and lo and behold, you have a baby after nine months. Ah! <laughs> baby wants doodle. -doo. Give her doodle. -doo. Give him doodle. -doo, yeah? So don't conflate the why and the how. And I agree with him. I actually empathize. And I mentioned this in my presentation. Again, let's be attentive. I said, I, he's an academic, and we do have some unfortunate religious people who don't use their minds who don't have critical thinking. And some of these scholars in this country, I mean, I don't know where they get the stuff from sometimes. But, you know, we have to be balanced, and we have to really be nuanced in our discussion and not throw the baby out of the bathwater, as they say. Also, you talked about Big Bang. 
Um, again, you could use, I, I'm, I'm allowed to use empirical data to support my <laughs> axiom, to support my premise, to support my thesis. And I said again, it's just a supporting argument. So I think I've addressed most of your stuff. You did go on about Quran and science. However, I agree with you on that position anyway. Uh, we shouldn't look into the Quran that way. And I mentioned before about the classical position that basically whatever it does say about natural phenomena, it doesn't negate reality, which is a stronger position. And when we do, and I, and I actually show, shown this to be true, because the Quran's view on fertilization is not the same as Galen or Aristotle, which was the predominant view of the seventh century at that time. So the Quran is not based on the seventh century worldview if we have a critical analysis on this. So I think this gives me another opportunity to basically, although I've dealt with some of the points the professor's made, is for us to be a little bit more nuanced when we look at religion. Because sometimes, especially when we study, we adopt a European-centric view on religion. Because in Europe, what happened was the Catholic Church used the coercive arm of the state to prevent thinking and rationality. And you had the post Enlightenment era, rather before that, you had Martin Luther pegging on a church store in Wittenberg, his thesis attacking the Catholic tradition. Then you had the 80 years war, the 30 years war, the massacre on St. Bartholomew's Day. It was a mess, blood chin high because of religion, Christianity specifically. And then you had the post Enlightenment era, you had the likes of Samuel Puffendorf, Hume, Locke, others, developing an individualistic doctrine of rights. So they said, look, God is one side and humans on the other, and you can do what you want, have free thought, thinking, etc., which was fair enough. But Islam didn't have that history, generally. We don't have the same historical baggage. If we read our history, the 12th century Renaissance was as a result of Muslim thinking. He talked about computers. Yeah, I'm sorry, but Muslims did. If they wouldn't have the likes of Al-Jabr, who created algebra, algebra, Al-Jabr, yeah? And you had algorithms. Then you, you wouldn't have. The former CEO of Hewlett Packard said, if it wasn't for the Muslims, we would have no computers. Now, I agree with you, the current Muslim world, especially in the past couple hundred years, is an absolute chaotic mess. Why? Is it because of the Quran that tells you to think, and tells you to reflect, and tells you to ponder? Doesn't sound like it. It's because of politics. It is because of politics. We don't have the state mechanism, the framework in place, to enable these things to happen. And this is what makes me quite, not angry, but... Vicious, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> what makes me a bit sad is that we have academics, and if Professor Hoodway was born in the 12th century, or in the, third, in the 10th century, and he was in the Muslim world, he would be saying the opposite. Well, Islam is so great because we've developed things to remove our tonsils. When we go to the Christian world, they chisel a cross on their head for headaches. We give them herbal medicines. Ibn Sina, for example, he created the book the canon of medicine that was used in Western Europe for 600 years, Professor Hudbay will be <coughs> claiming the glory of Allah, yeah? And his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But now, what he's done, he's jumped on the civilization of Bangwagon and saying, bye, bye. But I think that's so much, that's extremely shallow. And that's my humble opinion. That is very extremely shallow because at the end of the day, we know it's about politics. And I don't want the professor to be a reaction of his context. Transcend that type of slavery. That's a social slavery, your reaction to context. Human beings should never be a reaction to context. <coughs> and this is where I'm going to end by basically saying that, look, at the end of the day, this raises a bigger picture. And it raises the picture of who you are. And he was right, he didn't choose his parents, or he does love them, which is good. We don't choose our parents, we didn't choose our siblings. You didn't choose your eye color, your hair color, how tall you're going to be, whether you're going to be balding. Yeah? <laughs> we didn't choose these things, mashallah, tabarakallah. We didn't choose any of these things, right? We didn't choose a socioeconomic status, and it's exactly what the existential philosophers like Jean Paul Sartre <laughs> and Heidegger and Kierkegaard, they said there's a concept called thrownness. We're thrown into reality, and we have no choice. You're a slave, people. <coughs> Don't think you're free. You're a slave to the social biological context. But are you? Is that really who you are? If that's the case, then you're no different from a robot. You type in the, you type in the biological code, and you just act in accordance. I think it's a shadow. Human beings, even from an innate perspective, transcend this. We should transcend this. This is an existential question that science can never answer, to be honest, unless you just want to be a propagator of your own DNA. But I think that's a reductionist perspective that doesn't dignify man in any shape or form. In any shape or form. And we saw this with the Marxists <laughs> that used to torture the Christians and stand and kill six million Christians. And what did the biography say? They used to say to the Christians, rather the communists, they used to say to the Christians, ha ha. 
There's no divine accountability. No more motivation. See you later. Whether you become worms, meat, so I can pull your eye out and inject you with diseases and pull your skin off and boil you to death. Because I can. That's why Nietzsche, he was one of the most intellectual atheists because he was sincere to his own belief. Because he knew if you're really an atheist, there is no true morality. How is there? Because in the absence of the divine, do you have objectivity? You've heard some of the things that professor says about secularism and Islam and the theocratic state. Passing value judgment. This is wrong. How dare you? How dare you? This is not academic. This is not intellectual. You have no basis for your moral grounding. Because your only basis is social pressure or biology. Social pressure changes, so your morality will change. Biology, argue a random, lengthy product of a biological process. If that's the case, then we're still changing, and you're contingent on these changes, therefore your morality will change. And it has no true meaning, as the professor of science, Michael Rules, from the University of Guelph, what did he say? He says, you think when you say, love thy neighbor as, thy, as thyself, you think you're referring above and beyond yourself, but you're not. It has no true meaning. We're just a product of survival and reproduction. So when we see a lion killing a deer or something, do you call the police and say there's a murder? No, because it's just, that's what they did. Well, that's what we do as humans. This is normal. So your moral judgments on what people do is just like disliking someone picking the nose at the dinner table. But that's the reality. The divine Allah is the only metaphysical anchor, ontological anchor, that transcends human subjectivity. Now, you may disagree with the divine, but don't form your value judgments and say, this is right, this is wrong. Because it's not objective in the first place, philosophically. Let's be academic here. This is going to be relative or subjective. Well, it's probabilistic. Oh, I think it's bad. But it's all right, continue. Yeah. So the point I'm trying to say, brothers, sisters, and friends, we need to find out who we are. And when we know who we are, we only could find out as a result of why we are. Which I think I gave a good rational thesis for the existence of God and a rational thesis for the Quran. And that gives us the answer of why we are. We're here to worship Allah. And worship Allah is a comprehensive term. It doesn't mean headbutting the four or five times a day. It actually means smiling at your brother to make him smile. He even means following the Prophet when he said, for every cure is a disease, so seek the cure. <coughs> Amazing, huh? Amazing, that's why the Arab, according to Roy Porter, Pino Pureshi, and many other social historians of medicine, they conclude that the Arab Islamic medical learning was the best gift to mankind. Unfortunately, there was political disasters and we lost our way somewhere. But I believe if we follow this concept of worship, which is comprehensive, which is feeding the poor, charity, etc., it's comprehensive. It shapes your worldview and it's how you feel truly happy. Because every human being wants to be happy. But the true happiness is when you serve others. And I would say the profound happiness is when you serve God in order to serve others. Double happy. So from that perspective, we know why we are. When we know why we are, we know whose we are. We belong to God. So it fulfills these existential questions that science has no say in any shape or form. This is why in Norway, one of the most greatest atheistic countries in the world, around 40% of people are taking antidepressant tablets because they have a fake kind of happiness. They don't know who they are, where they are, whose they are. And these are valid questions for our youth, valid questions for myself, valid questions for everybody. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika, ashhad wa la ilaha ila anta wa astafu lakum tu bilayk. Thank you very much. My friend Hamza seems to have dozed off because he really wasn't listening to what I was saying. Where was I making value judgments? Where was I saying this religion as compared to that is good or not so good? I was saying no such thing. I was saying you are where you were born. A few people might cross, most won't. So, Listen to what I was saying, instead of using words like shallow. Now, my friend, the objection that I have to you. So I said it was on TV. You weren't listening to what I was saying. I never said you said it here. The I said it was on TV. Yeah. What, what, what you have insisted upon is somehow bringing science into this, using words like the data and cosmology show. Well, my dear chap, if I was to ask you to write down Einstein's equation for the expanding universe, I bet you wouldn't be able to do it. Would you? You could try me. Well, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. 
No, I can't tell you. No. <laughs> because all this is stuff that you've read in popular science books. And you don't know these things. You think you do because you've read popular accounts. So please don't go outside of your field of expertise and hang important theological issues onto, I'd say, popular level knowledge. Now you see, the problem of religion and science is a very deep one. And it depends a lot upon how you read the text. And different people will read it differently. Now I'll give you a little anecdote. This was 1984 when Professor Abdus Salam, you know he's the one, got the Nobel Prize. He called me into his office and he said, uh, this was in Italy, Trieste, and he said, I just received this book by um, Sheikh Ibn al-Baz, who was the rector of Makkah University. And the title of the book was, it was in Arabic, Jiryan al-Shams wa Qamar wa Sukut al-Ars. Who can translate this for me? What it means is the stationarity of the earth and moon and the movement of the sun. Jiryan al-Shams. What Sukut of al means, the silence of the earth. The, 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 the Sukut means stationarity. Yeah. Stationarity. stationarity. Yeah. And in fact, this uh, Sheikh al-Baz, he was, as I said, the rector of Medina University. He had made his career on saying that the earth was, that from his understanding of the Quran, that the earth was stationary, the sun went around it. Now, BBC television had called up Professor Salam and uh, said that Sheikh Baz is willing to debate with you on this. And so Professor Salam looked at me and said, so I said, are you going to go? And he says, do you think I'm crazy? Now, the geocentric view of the Earth had been there before Copernicus came about. And not one Muslim, not one Muslim astronomer had said that, it's, that the Ptolemaic model is wrong. Why? Because they chose to, rule, to read the Quran in that particular way. Now, other examples. When you try to relate the physical world with any holy text, be it the Bible, be it the Gita, be it the Quran, you're going to be relying upon knowledge that belonged to those times. And hence you have this idea that uh, miracles actually happened, that God got very angry and he flooded the earth, and that all the animals, one of every species or two of every species, went onto this ark. But the fact is that science has looked all around and found no evidence that this could have happened. It makes no sense from a scientific point of view. <coughs> it's a nice story. And by the way, the only Muslim who had the courage to say this was Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. He gave a detailed explanation of how you should understand this in the Quran. And he wrote a tafsir of the Quran, which had explanations like this. He said, you've got to understand it in the language of those times. You've got to view everything that there is in the holy book, which he regarded as the true word of God, <coughs> but from the point of view of science, and interpret and reinterpret until the two mesh together. Similarly, how are you possibly going to take the, the, the prayer for rain, namaze istasqa, salat istasqa, which says that it'll rain if you pray. Now, heavens, if you look at how many people pray for rain in Saudi Arabia, that should be a tropical desert, a tropical forest. Yeah. It's not. If you look at the times of drought over here, 
you have mass public prayers. Does it rain? Well, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. It depends upon the meteorological conditions. <coughs> now here is where it becomes extremely dangerous to relate the physical universe to the truths of what is there in the Quran. It's that, yeah, and here I would say that the only explanation which is consistent with science, which, or rather, the only way out, and that's the one provided by Sayyid Ahmad Khan, is that you say the Quran is correct, science is correct, but you have to read the Quran in a, in a way so that the possibility of miracles becomes allegorical. Now you see, that's the sort of difficulty that people like Hamza avoid. <coughs> All they do is talk about things about which they have half-baked knowledge, M theory. Now, if I was to ask you what is M theory, boy, I'd get a blank, I think. Unless you'd care to write down what it's all about. How can you do something like that without knowing what it is? How can you talk about Big Bang cosmology without being able to write down Einstein's field equations? And yet people do, because everybody is convinced that what they were born into is right. And so be it. Let that be the criterion of truth. I'll stop you. Please, please uh, identify who you're asking the question to. Uh, and I have certain questions from both of them. Okay. Um, so first of all, uh, I'd like to drop in my question to Mr. Hamza. Then when you said the concept of self-creation that anything cannot be created from, uh, from nothing. So, uh, and you said, and you quoted uh, certain uh, verses from the Quran that don't you don't you use your mind? Now, what about the, uh, the uh, uh, about the God Allah? Now we have been to, uh, we are we have been told in the Quran and as well from the other uh, religious people who interpret Quran that uh, Allah has, uh, Allah has been created from nothing and He is He is there from from some from nothing. Okay. Now He is being created from. Now, if you believe that He is created from something, that 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 something is Allah rather than the one that is being created. So I need your answer for that because uh, there is no such su uh, sufficient okay, uh, good. theory to, uh, good. to explain that. This is, this is precisely the point why we all have to listen. And when we judge something, we have to at least have some form of knowledge about judging something. Yeah. Now, first and foremost, the Quran doesn't say in any shape or form that God was created from nothing. It's not in the Quran. I would actually give you a million rupees if you could find that in the Quran. Okay, that God came from nothing. I'll give you two million rupees. Actually, I'll become an atheist. See, so when we approach something, and this is why we should use like emotional baggage, like the professor accused me of not knowing. Not knowing an equation doesn't mean you won't know how to understand it. If I asked him about Arabic for him to write me some verses in the Quran, he may not know how to write them. But yet he'd pass his judgments on them. If I asked him about science in the Quran, about embryology, would he know anything? That's the point. So the point is, let's not have outdated cliches about people now and to create like ad hominem, like, you know, basically attack something in order to think that it's going to break down an argument. I think it's, it, for a professor to come and say that, I think it, 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 you've lost your ground. And let me address the question. In, the, in, in Islam, we believe God did not come into being. The argument is, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Not whatever exists. There's a big difference. And we believe God is eternal, meaning He has no beginning and no end. So the whole self-creation thesis you pose is a mis misplaced argument. And the reason we believe, we believe God is on cause is due to various reasons. <coughs> First and foremost, by definition. By definition, definition, from ontological perspective, the concept of God is a deity that has no beginning and no end and wasn't brought into being. So you don't have to question how. Secondly, we know this also by Reason. If we say what created the creator that created the universe, there'll be an absurdity of infinite regress, which would mean that there is no creation in the first place. <coughs> nice smile, yeah? Smile, you get it. The, pen, the pennies dropped, yeah? yeah? Good. I'm quite shocked that in Muslim country we, we have these questions. Don't get me wrong, it's a valid question. We get it all the time in the West. But in, in Pakistan, it shows two things. One, there's a big, huge link, a missing link between the scholars and the people. And I blame the scholars, and it's sad. And I feel, I feel for you guys. Because we have scholars in England that are really in tune with the people. 
and we discuss about various things and yes, we borrow knowledge from scientists, because they claim it to be universal, we take it and we say, right, is this a supporting argument? It's not the argument, as I mentioned, it's a supporting argument. So we have a good conversation now, and I feel for you, as you study here? No, I'm from Karachi. You're from Karachi, okay. You came all the way from Karachi? There's a conference in that. Oh, that's good. Okay, I'll put it just for the professor. He's so famous, man. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I hope I hope I've answered the question about. Good. Uh, who has a question, for Professor Woodwell? Let's take it in turns. Uh, I have just a comment about what uh, Mr. Hamza said. The professor does not need to reproduce Arabic because he did not rely upon it. Uh, I mean, let's say if you ask him, and you when he, you were asked to let's say uh, when you talk about anything, you you relied upon those things. So you should be, I mean, one could reasonably expect you to reproduce that, or at least demonstrate uh, a certain minimum understanding of what you rely upon, which was, of course, a certain minimum degree of science. So see, that parallel, of course, is hopelessly inexact. No, that's unfair. I'll tell you what, that's unfair. That's unfair. Because in my presentation, I never relied on science as a supporting argument, if these things are true. Because my main position was a philosophical position based on rationality. Yeah? Then I was, if these things are true, for example, if the physicists I speak to say that this is the current conclusion of empathy, and they say, therefore, there must be a grand mathematician, I say that's a useful, it's a useful position. I'm not relying on any shape or form. I can actually reproduce this whole argument, not based on anything to do with scientism. Yeah? So that's the first point. The second point is as well, I'm sure the professor could defend himself. Yeah, I'm sure uh, he has the ability. And the third point, and the third point, sir, the third point, sir, with, with respect, yeah? The third point is this, if you pass value judgments on the Qur'an, whether it's a judgment that's incompatible with science, then wouldn't it be fair, especially when you've written books on this, to understand what is compatible with science in the Qur'an? Wouldn't it be fair to do that? That's my point. If you can, we'll reproduce the verses. Talk to me about it. So that's why I want to say is, if you flip the coin, I could use what Professor did to me, to him as well. Do you see? Because even so, this, this shows the whole thing about intentionality. I came here to have a frank, honest discussion. No once has the professor addressed any of my points about the Quran being a rational miracle because of its linguistic inimitability and to do with the to, to, to do with God's existence. Why aren't these addressed? Do you want to engage with me as a human being? Do you want to have a positive intellectual discussion? Engage with this position. Why are we going doing the straw man of my argument? No once have I spoken about science in the Quran. But we still talk about earthquakes, we still talk about um, speed of light, which I even said in my presentation, I agree with him, but yeah, he's still bringing it in. For me, and I studied psychology, so you know, I have to read your mind, yeah? <laughs> For me, that shows to me there's something wrong with intention here. Do we have an agenda to portray Islam no, no, and reduce it. Islam, it reduce Islam to something that's backward medieval? And this is the point. If we want to interact with each other as human beings in this country, in this universe, in this planet, we should have a listening methodology, which is called listening with the intent to understand. And, and it's even shown, and it's explicit in the professor thinking that I quoted him in here, when I even said, when he's written elsewhere. You're not listening, spoken, you're just speaking. You've had your say. I'm going to let you speak. You know what, I could be here till Fajr, we could have a conversation. I love talking. I love connecting with That's human clear. beings. That's clear. That is clear. I know. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah? So the point, although it may agitate you, I do apologize for that, but my sincere intentions is to engage. Hence, I've agreed with you in some things, and you haven't agreed with anything, or even trying to engage with me. Well, what's there to agree with you on? You, you, you bring out arguments which have no basis. Well, tell me how. They, That's they, the they may be right, they may be wrong. You say the Quran is miraculous. Well, fine, but you don't have to give a proof for that. Why not? And you cannot give a proof for that. It's something that you believe in. Now, if I... That's not true, though. That's no. a straw man no. of my no. argument. No, it's, it's a logical it's, fallacy. You, you say that there's nothing better that could have been written. I didn't say that. Or you don't believe okay. that? OK, Professor, do me a favor. You don't believe that? Professor, do me a favor. If you don't know what I said, say, Hamza, well, Hamza you, better? You, Explain it to me. But hang on. How can we explain well, it to you? Yeah, yeah. Don't now start guessing what I said. This is wrong. You said, you said, you said that there's nothing the better could No, I didn't say that. You said no, that. no, of course you did. Not <laughs> once have I said that word. Of course you did. I said, well, 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 I said the Quran, eight minutes, eight minutes. I said the Quran is a unique literary form. I even spent five minutes discussing it has nothing to do with aesthetic reception, which means beauty. I even quoted Romeo and Juliet or Abdullah Abdullah for you guys, yeah? Now please, this is, this is dishonest and intellectual dishonesty. 
If you don't know the argument, say, I want to engage with you, teach me the argument. The last thing I want to hear is making a caricature and a cartoon of what I said. This is not Pakistani hospitality. Islamabad is far better than that perspective. <laughs> okay, Tommy, let's uh, continue with the next question, please. If you can state your name and who you're directing your question to. My name is Rizwan, and uh, I'd like to get Professor Rupo's opinion on uh, what the current understanding of science is about how the universe is created. Louder, please. Louder, please. I'd like to understand what the current understanding of science is about how the universe was created from from time zero or before zero? OK, I don't think that was really the subject of this discussion. I mean, we're not in a cosmology class. But uh, to answer your question briefly, it's the Big Bang. There's lots of evidence for it. There are details of the Big Bang which are being explored through uh, things like inflation theory, which describe the universe at times less than 10 to the minus 15 seconds, and the effects of which are seen in the microwave, in fluctuations of the microwave background. So it's on very solid grounds. There's experimental proof. There's theoretical reasoning which supports it. It's all based upon Einstein's equations, which I absolutely insist one should know before one uses such arguments. Uh, but could I, could I ask, yeah. could I ask is is it science's domain to infer what became what, what came before the Big Bang? Ah, now that's a very good question. The answer is absolutely not. Okay. Science will not tell you some things. It will not tell you why you exist, what is the purpose of your life, what your morals ought to be. So are you saying that the existence or non-existence of a creator who predated the Big Bang is outside the domain of science? Absolutely. Okay. Science deals with, Very clear. with the physical universe. It doesn't deal with the question so of how, so why we are here or um, who started the universe. Okay. That's a question outside of the domain of science. So can I ask the question, how can an atheist honestly be an atheist if he cannot, if he's basically tied himself up by saying that this is not science's domain. It's a, it's a question which I'm struggling with because I'd like to understand how an atheist can be sincerely um, rebutting somebody who believes in a creator when he doesn't even entertain that domain of thought as, 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 as being subject to science. I mean, it's just a question. I, I mean, I'd like to understand how that, that, that thought process. Well, if, if you look at scientists, some of them are atheists, some are agnostics, and some are even religious people. Science does not enter into these issues because not every scientist is, is concerned with uh, the question of what brought this all about. You can take your pick. You can even go for, there was a creator who created a creator who created a creator and go into infinite regress. That too is not illogical. It's, it's just a recursive statement. So you, you could take recursion. You could believe in one god. You could believe in... Uh, 5,383 gods. It's your choice. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank both of you uh, for, for this speech. It was really good. Um, I have a question to the professor. Um, <coughs> Sorry, could you wait for the mic for the camera? Because the camera mic is thank you. Is that the only um, between the two of you? Okay. Okay. Uh, I mean, this is fine. I, I'm in the camera. Okay, no, no camera, just the sound. All right, okay, sorry about that. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, um, my, uh, my question to you is that you mentioned that we should take signs and the Quran uh, both, but we should not merge them, right? Um, so I want to know how uh, can we do that? And just, just before you answer, um, I do agree with your Big Bang theory, 
uh, being correct because in the Quran it mentions the Big Bang Theory. It also uh, has over 600 verses in, in relation to science, from evaporation to rain, from embryology, everything. Uh, over 600 verses. How can you say that we can take them both but not merge them and, and then only have a pathway across? How is that possible when Quran uh, said so many things for 1,400 years ago, which we found out maybe only 2,000 to 6,000 years ago? Well, if the Quran was a book of science, then surely. She didn't say it was a book of science. Then surely. If you find so, okay, let the, let the professor answer to you. Yeah, okay. otherwise, uh, perhaps you would, you would like to make a comment? It's okay. It's her You're taking now. her question the wrong way. Ah. If this book, if the holy book had uh, science in it, then surely in the last 1,000 years, we would have gained some new knowledge in the form of uh, a testable experiment, in the form of a machine that was built, in some working device with the ants, but in spite of the fact that Muslims read it day in and day out, there's nothing to show for it. All the discoveries have been made by the Aghyar. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, it's only, um, uh, I, I just want to get it clear for myself, basically. No, uh, I, I don't want to counter argue, but I just want certain things clear for me. Um, it's, in, in the Quran, it was mentioned 1400 years ago that the earth actually is uh, in the shape of an ostrich egg. Initially, we, science, had found out that it's circled later on. It was, now it's said that it is in, in the um, you know, ostrich egg-like shape. Now even science believes that. So how can we not take both of them together? How can we have them separate? Uh, it is practically impossible, uh, in my opinion, because it's the word of God, maybe where uh, our humans, we stop thinking that's where God starts thinking. What we Muslims believe is not what Islam is. Islam is what Quran is, what it is, not how we practice it. Um, does someone have a question for Brother Hamza? Yeah. We'll take it in turn. Yeah, for Brother Hamza? <laughs> Oh. I have gentlemen here. Okay. All right. Why do I have a question for both? Um, we would prefer having Brother Hamza first because we're taking it in turns. Yeah, I think you took two questions <coughs> first, and then we only need to talk one question. So let's let's be fair and have, have it both sides. Uh, Maybe you should come and moderate. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, uh, number one, um, I, I think to to make a judgment uh, on, on selective discussions and conversations with the selected clerics that sit on t uh, television and, and taking uh, the position of Sheikh Bin Baz. Uh, I, I, I would be saddened by anyone who makes a judgment on Islam or, or, or its premise just from this observation. My question to both speakers is, because it seems that the paradigm or the source of judgment uh, for both speakers is, is different. Uh, for the professor, it seems the source of judgment seems to be clearly science and what can be sensed in, in reality. And it seems uh, for uh, Brother Hamza that, uh, that the source of judgment is not just the observation of reality, it's, it's also textual based. So the question to both speakers is, uh, how are you going to decide between the two? Because I'm going back to the topic, which is religion and uh, rationality. It doesn't seem that we're sticking the whole discussion to, to the basic topic, which is religion and rationality, because the professor himself described rationality as cause and effect, then he limited the whole big bang to simply science, which is only to do with tangible things, yeah. and it has got nothing to do with the cause. It's like me saying that someone painted the room, who gives a damn who's a painter? Uh, someone brought the light in, who gives a damn who's, who's, who's the scientist behind it? I would like to have an answer from both speakers regarding the source of judgment and the source of thinking. It seems that Hamza has two and the, uh, our uh, dear professor has one, which is simply science and observation of reality. Yeah, sure. That's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, no. You sound like a fellow <clears throat> Brit. 
No, I studied in Britain. Oh, okay. I'm not a Brit, I'm Pakistani. And I'm pretty kind of guy, I'm pretty kind of guy. So, he had a tuk tuk, the hard guitar. Basically, what, what, what I'd like to say again about this is true, it's about definitions and I think the professor's definitions are conflicting in some form because if you want to study Western philosophy, even Islamic philosophy, you see that rationalism is not just empirical based on experience. So the question is the big, what happened before the Big Bang? Because all the Big Bang tells us that there's a, like a space-time boundary almost, that the universe began at a point. Now if that's the case, rationality raises the question, you, how, why did this happen? That's reason, using logic and reason. Now, all of a sudden, like, you suspend that, you become a hardcore logical positivist, or a verificationist, or an empiricist, which means, no, you need empirical data only. But one minute, science is defined by using logic and reason, plus observation and experience. And the other way is just, no, you have to suspend your thinking in certain things. I think definitions need to be clarified. My source of knowledge obviously is textual and reality. Now why is it textual? Now in Islam we have two concepts called the Naql and the Aql. Okay? The Naql is the text, which is the Quran, the prophetic traditions, and the Aql is the intellect, which the intellect is the, the, and the trying to understand reality. And in Islam we must bring the Naql and the Aql together, as Ibn Taymiyyah, the famous scholar, once said. Now if you just result, rely, rely on the Naql, then you become a Naqlhead. Yeah. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to say is, why do I believe in the text? Well, I gave my ra my reasoning, my reason why I believe the text to be from the divine. It's rational. The whole topic today is religion and rationality. If you want to come and discuss this, then you need to provide a cogent argument against my argument for the Quran, or at least break it down or construct one for yourself. And so yes, you're right. I have those two realities because I find them highly reasonable. Highly reasonable. I hope that answers the question. Well, uh, now if I may respond. <laughs> Everyone thinks that his holy text is descended from above. By definition, that's holy. But now to come to your question. Who painted the room? <clears throat> um, this is an issue that Voltaire had raised about 300 years ago, 250. But Voltaire said that, look, it all had to come from somewhere. Somebody had to make it, just as you say. And yet Voltaire was a rationalist. And he gave this, this uh, analogy with a watchmaker who makes a very intricate watch with gears and springs and levers and they work in perfect unison. And so he came up with this analogy that God is the perfect watchmaker who's made the laws of physics right at the very beginning and you don't have to have a big bang to go to the beginning. There wasn't such an idea at that time. He said, God made the laws of physics. And then with those laws came the universe. And like the watch, he put it on the table. And now it ticks away. But the thing is that you cannot, you as a creature of God, cannot now interfere in the workings of that watch. You cannot supplicate God to cause rain over there, an earthquake over there, <coughs> or not have rain, or not have an earthquake. Those laws of physics that govern the universe are immutable, <coughs> made by God, and God doesn't break his own laws. He will break his own laws yeah. if he listens to you and causes a miracle. Uh, just a correction, it wasn't Voltaire, it was William Paley. It was Voltaire. Okay. You're wrong. <laughs> Who has a question for Brother Hamza? Now we'll yeah. take it in turns from here. Yeah, um, I have a bunch of questions because I'm just one of the listeners who is listening quite interesting. Can you keep the um, mic a little away from yourself, yeah. please? Well, that's, that causes a problem because I would not be hearing myself. Um, <laughs> Cause and effect. Yeah. <laughs> the first thing would be I have a bunch of questions and um, um, I was well, let's keep it at one, one question. Um, Pick the most important one. Yeah, because I just stated that one because um, I was listening quite intently that Mr. Hamza was saying that, you know, the uh, my premises are going away and no one is listening enough. Uh, I was better off in Islamabad, not in Lahore, um, for that reason. 
Um, well, uh, his notation about God was that you know that God was of uh, God created um, from the Big Bang. My question is that we suppose God to be omnipresent, omniscient, continuously acting, continuously fighting the battles for the moments um, in, in the battles, and continuously, you know, one way, if he is offended, he gets away. Uh, he is not going to take part in the next battle for us. Uh, how could you say that that God, with anthrop anthropomorphic notations, such as he thinks, he sees, he hears, he acts, he judges, that sort of God is the same God that created the Big Bang. How could that be? You know, that God of completely unknown nature is completely something who takes part in every particle of this earth and is deterministic and he knows how it acts. It absolutely sounds away from rationality. The first question is, the anthropomorphic notation of Quranic God, how it acts according to the Big Bang theory. My second question Can we is, answer the first question and then somebody else will be given a chance, please? <coughs> well, Hamza. Well, the, ne the next question is very, very important because he, he said that, you know, that Quran is uh, the work of God because it does not fit into the rhyming scheme. That was his logic. 16 rhyming schemes, I'm a student of literature as well. Uh, 16 rhyming schemes, since it does not fit into that, so it's divine. The question is, there are millions of languages around this earth. There are thousands of tribal languages. They do not expose to any particular uh, form of literature. They do not agree with any of themselves. Some of them do not even have verbs, you know? These sort of languages. Basic languages, uh, tribal languages, they have found how they, they could not even uh, express time. For example, he worked, he worked, he worked in their language. They do not follow any substantial structure. So are they divine themselves as well? And any verb or thing who does not agree with any particular scheme is divine. Is that true? Uh, agreeing with your principle? Okay, it's a very good question. I'm going to start with the last one. First and foremost, I didn't say the Quran doesn't not only agree with the rhyming scheme. What I said was the reality of the Arabic language is that every time you express yourself as a human being, the source text producer, the person who produces text or an oral tradition or orality, whatever the case may be, does so and always fulfill, it always fills itself or can be categorized in prose, which could be subcategorized into mursal, straightforward speech, or saja, rhyme prose. Significantly, there's another form, literary form, called poetry, which according to the poetic patterns, you have the al-bihar. That's the reality of Arabic language, every time. So if you use observation and experience, every time you speak, it's either normal speech, rhyme prose or poetry, every time. The Quran doesn't fit into any of these known forms. That's my point. My point is this, the miraculous nature of the Quran is miraculous due to the fact that when we exhaust the reality of the Arabic language, 28 letters, finite grammatical rules and words, we exhaust it. <coughs> And we can't, we can't produce the form of the Qur'an. It's still for, it's still, the, the, if we do anything, it still falls into the category of prose and rhyme prose or poetry. That itself requires the question. That categorization as prose, prose, uh, prose poetry and uh, all that stuff is done just for conventions. It's done by those people who agree that these agree that these things happen so much continuously that they should be branched as such thing. What my premise was that you know that that sort of thing that a new literary form has been created. Yes. The Quran has been said throughout history. It was the first written prosaic form of uh, written um, um, essay form, I, I, prose and poetry, prose form of Arabic. Okay. Before that, there was no prose form. Before that, even the the literary uh, things were poets. And uh, the, their poems, poems used to be hung in, in the Holy Kaaba. Yes. That was their literary form. Yes. The, the bookish form, the first book of Arabic language is Holy Quran. Okay. So my premise is that a different form of language, a different form of speaking does not mean it's divine. For example, uh, how could Hebrew be divine then? Sorry? How could Hebrew, Hebrew mm -hmm. be divine then? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and the other thing would be that uh, I think. Um, wait, 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 uh, 
Wait, you, uh, you mischaracterized the argument. Let me give an example. We're saying the whole, the whole uniqueness of the form is based upon the challenge to try and reproduce the form. And let me give an example. We can reproduce poetry with the al-bihar, with the rhythmical patterns. We can reproduce rhyme prose. It ends with a rhyme. It has an accent based with rhythmical pattern. It has a concentrated use of rhetorical devices. We could reproduce these things. The point I'm just saying, you can't reproduce the Quran. And, in, and what you're saying is actually inaccurate. If you study Arabic gram grammar and, the, and, and stylistics properly, there's a very good book by Professor Abdul Rauf from Leeds University. And he wrote a book <coughs> called Arabic Stylistics. There's another book called Quranic Stylistics as well. And you'll be informed in this. And essentially, they used to have the orators doing rhyme prose before anyway. You had the soothsayer speech, which is called kahin, which is a form of rhyme prose. You had poetry, which you had the ukas fair, they used to debate in poetry and challenge people with regards to their skills and rhetorical devices and eloquence. So the form's already there. The point is, what the grammarians did, there was a source period of the Arabic language, which was a hundred years before, around a few hundred years before the Quran, a few hundred years after. And this was a source text period. The grammarians call this the source text period. Now, what they did was, for, for a grammatical rule or stylistic rule to be sound, it has to conform with pre-Islamic poetry and pre-Islamic oratory and post-Islamic. They had to all co conform with each other. So it's not, the grammar wasn't formed just for the Quran's sake. So this requires obviously a bit more depth in understanding the development of the Arabic language and what Arabic language actually is. So the issue is, it has its own unique form, How is and it says, let's have, okay, one second, one second, one second, one second, one second. Hebrew, no one's claiming Hebrew to be divine. Who's claiming Hebrew to be divine? I, I don't know, I don't understand the argument. How, how, Hebrew is another language. Yes. Um, and how come that the, the Old Testament or the New Testament yes. has been transferred from from, from Hebrew Sir, to Greek to English? Back to please. I mean, okay, but, okay. Now I don't I don't see. Just go to the first okay. question. Uh, that I think we've had enough of that question. We can have another debate just on that. We should we have a question? Can we have a question from Professor Hood? Well, let's take it. Can it be the last one because yeah. everyone? Is the time is up. Uh, half an hour last. Right. Right. Uh, with all due respect, I don't understand what disagreement you have with religion, what, what the whole purpose of debate is in the first place. If your, your fundamental argument is that what religion says cannot be proven by science, that is broad because science is gone by time. What science said 100 years ago, it contradicts today. So what exactly is the problem? I don't get that. I mean, he, he's arguing that something totally different. He's arguing specifics. What is the fundamental problem with religion in the first place that's against science? He doesn't like God, you see. No, I, I, I'm not saying there's a problem. I'm saying you don't have to prove what is what is true. You cannot possibly prove that Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alaihi was the was a prophet of God. Of course you can. Of course you can. Yeah, you have to you have to believe it. Okay? You have to believe that the Quran is the word of God, kalam e lahi You have to believe it. You have to believe that there are angels. Why do I need proof for that? Let the religious people believe what they want to. Let me do science the way I want to. And I don't see any link between the two. You can have people of diverse religions, diverse countries coming to the same conclusion in science. You'll never have two religious people agree. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, with, with, due, with due respects, yeah, with due respects, uh, it's a bit of a culture clash. We come away from Britain to have these intellectual discussions. And Britain is a little, little bit more nuanced. Now, maybe because you're a product of the Muslim world that you hate so much. Now, let me see. This, 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 this is this is where I think you are lying. You are lying. I have not said I hate the Muslim world. I didn't say you hate. You it. should. You just said it. Shame on you. Oh, yes, sorry, I did. Well, I meant Shame on you. Let's not take this Shame on you. Listen, listen, listen. listen. No, 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 no. Let's be fair, let's be fair. Sorry. The professor not once has addressed any of my premises. I you say that you're you a liar. You miss it. I say you're a liar. OK, let's not get personal. Is this an academic uh, way to have intellectual discussion? When, when, when you uh, say you wrong, show even as well as you dare wait, to say wait, such wait, you show signs you, of hatred. You, you do show signs of you, hatred. You are a liar. You don't engage you with me. Wait, 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 w
who's been imputing various things oh, to sir, me, please, please, who's please, sitting please, over please, here, please. saying things that I okay. never said. Okay, okay, sir. Yes? Please, 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 I didn't say you. Shame on you. I said Shut up. you show sure signs of hatred for the Muslim world. Okay, let's... Wait, 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 wait,
Uh, what happened at this debate was that uh, I can relate to Hamza in terms of the, point, the arguments and the points that he was making. But Professor Boy, unfortunately, he was swaying all those points away. He was just, you know, moving the debate into something that would favor what he was saying. He used personal attacks and, you know, um, something that I want to say about this debate that really sums all of this up, these, these two uh, belief systems, uh, something that really sums them up is the fact that during the end of the debate, we saw a little scene happen, but, you know, we saw the reaction of both parties. On one side, we had a Muslim who believes in Allah, who follows the Sunnah, and on the other side, we had Professor Hood Boy, who's advocating uh, the non-existence of God and, you know, the conflict religion and rationality uh, between each other, and the conflict religion and science have between each other. At the end of the day, who turned out to be a very person? Hey, brothers and sisters, yeah. if you want to know more about the arguments posed today, if you go to hamzadoris.com on one reason, under hamzadoris.com there is a chapter that details uh, the linguistic and literary miracle of the Qur'an that was reviewed by Medina scholars, okay? That was said it's okay. So read that. Also go to albayyina.com that gives more like nice nuances. Albayyina.com. <laughs> Um, and also there's an argument here called the Quranic argument for God's existence, which is the premises I gave. The universe began to exist. How? Create from nothing? Create itself? Or was created? It's something very simple. But it's detailed a bit more with a bit of referencing, so you understand what's going on here. I really apologize how it turned out. Not one of my de debates in Britain have ever turned out like this. However, I'm going to email him and apologize, because we should do that. Because if you did feel offended, you still apologize anyway. But I don't think it's conducive for dialogue. And all you guys... You must email me. We have Skype chats every week. Yeah? So you do what I do. Because I'm no one special. I'm a speck of dust. Come from Hackney. You probably have maids in your house. I've never had maids in my house before. <laughs> I was, you know, we were, we were, I was working class, yeah? You guys are far more better than me. I come from the West. So if you can't be like me, then God knows what can happen, yeah? That means I must be a miracle, yeah? But <laughs> Professor said there's no miracle, so I can't be a miracle, yeah? <laughs> yeah? Come and engage with us. You have everything. There's no excuse, okay? يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا اسْتَجِيبُوا لِلَّهِ وَلِرُسُولِهِ إِذَا دَعَاكُمْ لِمَا يُحْيِيكُمْ Yeah? Respond to the call of Allah and His Messenger that which gives you life. Okay? So if you need to be feel alive, respond to this call. أشرقت نفسي بنور من فؤادي حينما رددت